too many people want want to make too big an incremental step. They want to go right. from zero, they want to go from zero to a hundred in you know in 10 feet. And you can't go from zero to a hundred in 10 feet. And so incremental is a is a big deal. And I've watched, I mean, the young people who've come here for our apprenticeship program and things, I've watched numerous of them, you know, it, it, kind of in a three-step process. And so what might those steps look like? So the first step would be Jewel Salatine, how, Salatine, pardon me, how are you? I'm doing great, Andy, and uh, it's great great to be with you. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Let's start from the top here. As I mentioned off camera, you were quite the inspiration to me and my family uh, over a decade ago, just getting on to help food and eating well, part of our lives. And I just want to tell me about your story and what exactly you do at Polyface Farms. Yeah, so we're a, uh, our family came here when I was four years old in 1961. Uh, so if you're quick with math, you know that uh, I'm right at 67. And um, and we we came here, dad was an accountant, mom was a school teacher. And um, dad saw very early on, we, we always said dad was organic before Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring. And um his his dad, my paternal grandfather, was a charter subscriber to Rodale's Organic Gardening and Farming magazine back in what 1945, something like that. So dad grew up in that non-chemical composting, you know, uh, kind of arrangement, and he saw early on the just had a desire for, you know, self-reliance, self-sufficiency, uh, um, um, what uh, in, independence from you know, from the chemical cartels and the, and the system. And so we came to this, uh, gully worn out, um, rock pile in about 1961. And, um, and he, of course he was an accountant. He worked out. Mom was a school teacher and the two off farm jobs, you know, eventually paid the mortgage, took about 10, 11 years to, to pay for it. And during that time, we were basically glorified homesteaders. It was not a business. Uh, we, we, we grew our own food. We had our firewood, um, in 1967, I was 10 and I got my first chickens and I dipped my toe in this farm thing and just, and just loved it. I mean, I, I just loved it. Not only, not only as a, as a, almost a spiritual thing, but as a business that, that, you know, Hey man, I, I was selling eggs. I had customers. I, you know, um, I was. I was the man, you know, you, you, I, I, we got to call Joel. We need some eggs, you know, and, and as a kid, as a kid for, you know, to have, to have people who, whatever, uh, you know, patronize you and say, hey, you know, we depend on you for breakfast. Um, man, that's a, that's a powerful thing for a, you know, for a youngster. And so, uh, so I had these chickens and I really, you know, got the farm bug. There were three of us kids. And I was the only one who really took an interest, uh, uh, you know, a serious interest in the farm. And, um, and, uh, so we, we, so, so dad was, was extremely creative. Um, uh, you know, I'm at that stage in my life. I mean, he passed away 30, uh, in 1988, you know, it's been, um, more than 30 years, 35 years. And, and, um, I realize the, the older I get, the smarter he was. <laughs> and sometimes it takes a little while to realize that. But he he totally got the non-chemical, um, started moving cows around. He was a very much an inventor, uh, invented some portable electric fence at that time so we could move the cows around. Uh, we we started composting. We um, we direct marketed. We did he did a portable infrastructure, developed a, a portable shade mobile for cows, uh, portable chicken shelters for chickens. Uh, and, and we just, and we just headed down this, this pathway. So, uh, make kind of long story short. So in, so I came back to the farm full time, uh, September 24, 1982, I had worked two and a half years out for, as a investigative reporter for a, a local newspaper after college and, um, and, and was trying to, how do I get, you know, the farm was a great place to live, a you know, great food, great life. But it wasn't it wasn't a business, you know. How, how do we make a living here? And um, 
So Teresa and I, when we got the attic of the old farmhouse here, lived up in the attic, we called it our penthouse. It's all how you look at it. And uh, we drove a $50 car. We lived on $300 a month. If we didn't grow it, we didn't eat it. We didn't have a TV. We still don't have a TV. Uh, we, we, um, you know, we, we never went out to eat. We never went on vacation. We just, we just, you know, put ourselves to this. And within a couple of years, we had saved up enough. Um, Andy, I think it's important for everybody to understand. We saved up enough by living so cheaply. We were able to save up enough in two years that we could live here for one year without an income. Wow. So that was our nest egg. So I handed in my two week notice. Stepped out of that office. We came back home. Everybody thought it was the stupidest thing in the world. All of my friends, all of our acquaintances, what? You know, you're giving up a paycheck, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, uh, but, but my thing was by that time, uh, I, I realized that I was very employable. You know, I, 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 I was not afraid to wash dishes in the back of a restaurant. I didn't, you know, and, and I realized that if the farm didn't work out, I could find work anywhere because everybody's looking for somebody dependable, loyal, uh, who, 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 who uh, can think and doesn't whine and complain, that sort of thing. And, yeah. I tell it to my kids all the time, just have yeah. those qualities to show up and uh, be dependable yeah. and have a good attitude. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. The, the, the bar, the bar of dependability, <laughs> loyalty, and, 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 you know, giving 110% uh, is so low that you can get work anywhere. So anyway, came back to the farm. I fully expected that we wouldn't make it. I, I, I thought we would probably not, that I'd have to go back out off farm for a while. But as it turned out, that little, that little $10,000 nest egg, because we were leaving, living so cheaply, it just stretched and stretched into two years and then into three. And uh, we, we, we started direct marketing. We started the chickens. Uh, I sold firewood. I, you know, I, um, I helped a guy build fence for a little bit of cash. I helped a guy plant some trees for a little bit of cash. You know, so we were, we, we were just, what could we plug? You know, what, what could we plug the holes in? And by the end of the third year, by the end of the third year, we were able to sigh and say, Ooh, you know, I, I, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. It took us three years, but by the third year, we had a little customer base. Uh, things were moving along. And, um, and today, today, uh, we have 20, about 22 of us earn a living from the farm. Uh, we have about uh, 10,000 customers. We ship nationwide. We, uh, we, we have a thousand head of cattle. We do, I don't know what, 800 hogs a year. Uh, uh, 20, 24,000 chickens. Uh, we do, I don't know, a hundred, 120,000 dozen eggs. Uh, we have lamb, we have turkeys, um, rabbits, and we have a sawmill. So we sell lumber as well and, and continue selling firewood along some. Um, and, and it's a, you know, it's a, it's a real going concern. I mean, it's a, it's a real deal. Sure. So, yeah, you've touched on so many different things, um, but I'd like to start with, let's say, um, somebody that's a smaller scale, if you would. So, for example, I live in Atlanta, Georgia. We have a garden every year. We, during the summer times, we, we don't buy vegetables because we grow all of our own, but I live in suburbia. How does somebody, and this is really not for myself, but I just have... I have so many people inquiring. It's a thing now, urban farming. Yeah. How do you start and where would, where would you start if you would um, just even, yeah. Where would you start in all that? Yeah. Well, the, so it's, it's a proverbial, you know, what can you, what can you do now with what you have? And um, so many times people, I run into this all the time where people feel like they can't start because they don't have enough. And we live in a we live in a time of where um, we uh, we we cultivate in our culture we cultivate not enough. We go to bed we say I didn't get enough done. We get up in the morning we said I didn't get enough sleep. Uh, we say we don't. Have, you know we live in this not enough. So, so uh, the 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 key here is what can I do where I am with what I've got, and it can be as simple as. Um, as a quart jar of mung bean sprouts on the windowsill, 
you know, those are highly nutritious and uh, that can be done anywhere. Uh, it can be as simple as a little, um, you know, a little 12 inch by 12 inch uh, vermicomposting kit under your kitchen sink to get earthworm castings to at least, you know, uh, feed your potted plants. Um, you know, there are all sorts of neat uh, contraptions today, like these uh, these hanging PVC pipes with with uh, little pockets in them. And you pack compost in there, you hang it on your hang it on your front porch, you know, and you can have fresh herbs growing in these in these little um, these little pockets, uh, pots, you know, pot gardens. Uh, well, pot, you know, <laughs> that's a little bit of play on words there, pot gardens. Uh, but but, you know, um, you, you, you can have these uh, pots, you can have uh, honeybees, you can have a, a bee, a beehive on your roof of your house. Um in my book, Polyface Micro, I talk about how to have chickens and rabbits in a Manhattan apartment. Um, you know, you, using using deep bedding, it doesn't take any more footprint than a, than a lazy boy recliner. And you can have three chickens and you can feed them all your kitchen scraps. They'll get eggs for you. And um, and what you do is you you make you make a top and you make a bottom and the bottom is full of carbon that the chickens can stir, and basically make uh, make compost. And that eliminates odor, eliminates smell. And uh, and the chickens then are happy, and it's no more. It doesn't take a bigger footprint than a lazy boy recliner. So there are there are a tremendous number of things. In fact, on on my blog uh, back I don't know about a month and a half ago, uh, I had a a blog reader from Austria who does CAD design, and he used uh, some AI and CAD design to actually create a mock up of what a an apartment three chicken uh, you know, thing could look like, you know, glass, like a, like a terrarium and, uh, very, very clever. Uh, so, you know, there are, there are all sorts of things you can do in the city, um, to, to start down this, what I call a, a disentanglement path, a disentanglement. That's what I'm hearing, Andy. Andy, people come to me and they say, they say, you know, how do I disentangle? I just, I don't want to be entangled to the system anymore. How do I disentangle? Right. And, and, and that's what we're talking about. It really is. And also to give you some personal, I guess, anecdotal, uh, you could just say just experience. My wife and I are one of the happiest times, and even my kids, the happiest times we have are together and then being outside. And then just this fulfillment of growing our own stuff. We know where it's come for and we put in the labor and the time. It, and we know it's just good food. It's good organic food. So again, just personal anecdotal experience. And yeah, it's just a joy. Let's talk about, if you don't mind, um, scaling this, because I have some friends that are scaling this or trying to scale it. And I know you do a lot of consultative work. Uh, first of all, what are you seeing, if you would, with uh, people that want out of the discontang disentanglement and then they're going outside the city into a rural, more rural area. It doesn't have to be completely out of the, out of the city, if you would, but just more rural area and they're buying up land. Right. What's their, what are you seeing? Like, what is their motivation for that? And what are they uh, trying to accomplish? Are they just trying to get more land or are they trying to make something sustainable? And what are the challenges that they're facing as well? Yeah. So, um, so my latest book, uh, the title is, Homestead tsunami, uh, good for country critters and kids, and it's basically the why of of this. You just described it. This what I call a homestead tsunami. Uh, there there is a deep, intuitive I think understanding in the heart of people that if the wheels fall off, I don't want to be in a city. I, I right. want to I, I want to be you know where I can whatever shoot a deer. Uh, drink out of a spring, uh, build a teepee. You know, I mean, you can get as 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 whatever as as uh, survivalist as you want to get. But but the point is, it's it, it, if you're going to if you're going to survive in a crisis situation, it's generally uh, instinctually si uh, simpler um, in, in in a rural setting than in an urban setting. Now now. You obviously have a you have a yard. You've got a you know you've got a, a house situation. So you know in that situation, for example, if you invested in a in a cistern, for example, a cistern to catch rainwater, so that you had a 
a couple thousand gallons of potable water uh, off your roof. Well, then if the if the uh, if the city water shuts down, you've still got water. Uh, you know, you could have a solarium on the side of your house, and um, and and that solarium would grow vegetables in the in, in the winter time and give you passive heat. Um, so those are things in an urban setting you can do to kind of take the edge off of this. Um, off of the fragility or the the suscept the risk the risk of you know think that I think that things happen because because fraternities have a certain mindset and and they they head down a path maybe not intentionally but uh, uh, you know there there are outcomes of uh, of what of, of what of how you think and so a nation a, a culture for example like ours that now looks to the federal government to solve everything and wants an agency for everything that we do and more market intervention and all this um, is going to create a, you know, a, a fragile, a fragile system of economy of, uh, and, and a dependency culture. Yeah. Got it. So, so the new 401k is living proximate to people who know how to grow things fix things and build things. Right. That that's that's the new 401k. And so what's driving this this movement to the countryside, I think is um is a general understanding or 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 um whatever a, a, a lack of trust in these you know built environments and um and and people are looking more for you know, for something that gets them a little, a, a little bit of removal from dependency on, on, on the grid, on the, you know, on somebody else's water systems, you know, on all these things. What we found, or my wife and I, I guess our thought process is, let's say we had, I don't know, a thousand acres out in the country somewhere. And the motivation is not so much, uh, survival for a crisis or a survivalist, even though that very well could be it, that's part of it, but that's not the primary motivation. The primary motivation is just like, it's a quality of life, if you would. So let's say, assume that nothing happens, that we just, things are muddling around and go on their way. Well, we still have a great life, right? And then, and then, but let's say something does, we're fully sustainable. So either way we win, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that that that's exactly right. And um, and in, in this book, Homestead Tsunami, I I describe the why. Uh, and you know, we're having a. Uh, I don't want to go down too far a rabbit hole here, but Andy, we're having, we're having a um, an adolescent crisis in this country, from fentanyl to teen suicide to uh, I mean, you talk to any school counselor today, our our young people with with TikTok and everything else. And again, I don't want to get too far afield here, but but let me tell you, how does a young person, I'm just going to touch one one point here, how does a young person develop self-esteem, self-worth, you know, affirmation as a, as a person? How we do that is to be successful to at accomplishing meaningful tasks, to successfully accomplish meaningful tasks. All, each one of those four words is important. Successful, accomplishing, meaningful tasks. And so, yeah. So, so what what's happened, Andy, in our culture, is that we have we have um, um, reduced the ability of our 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 pre you know our 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 year olds to actually successfully complete meaningful tasks. They uh, they're just on screen time. They're on video games. Um, and so one of the things that, that this, this, um, visceral participation in, in, uh, you know, in, in growing and building and fixing things is you can sit back and say, Hey, you know, I grew that tomato. Um, I canned that applesauce. I, I cut up that chicken or, or, or you know, I, and, and those, those very, you know, uh, visceral functional elements of life um create self-worth they create yeah. self-worth and and i think that that this whole 
uh, kind of migration or, or or renewed interest in in rural life is not just yeah I want to grow my own tomatoes, but 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 there's 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 this whole umbrella of of societal and cultural uh, um, you know elements uh, wrapped up in it, and uh, that's part of what's what's driving this as well. Yeah, and again, so very well said. Some anecdotal experience again is I'm originally from uh, Alaska, and I have uh, five kids and two. I have two boys, and we took a, a guy's trip, a father and son trip back up to Alaska. This was last August, and that was during caribou hunting season. And uh, I knew some people up there and some family up there, and we took my boys and and I we went caribou hunting, and we got a caribou. It oh. was the best experience on every single level from just the adventure of it from uh just being together of it from the hardship of it and then actually killing our own meat and my freezer stocked with it <laughs> and then we processed it all together so it was uh, idea just exactly what you said it was just going back getting simpler but just being together and then having responsibility uh, just taking care and feeding ourselves. That's really, it was just, it was awesome. So, yeah, a- a- absolutely. You know, uh, responsibility and, and I would just say a uh, decision, decision-making, maybe we could call it discernment is a muscle. It's a yeah. muscle like, like any of our physical muscle. And, and when we have, when we um, are with our children or give our children uh, opportunities to exercise their discernment, you know, uh, is the chicken waterer clean or not? Uh, is the nest box clean or not? Uh, you know, um, um, do we, do I, do I water the tomato? Do I water the tomato today or not? Or does it need mulch? Or, you know, I mean, those kinds of visceral decisions exercise our, our discernment. And, um, and, and, it, and, and it's on a completely different level than, um, than whether or not uh, you should push this button on Candy Crush, right? It, 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 it's a, it's a totally different deal, and and uh, and and ch- children children understand that they they realize when they're actually being needed and needful, and providing value value to the family and value in their own lives, and and they yearn for that. Um, yeah. In spite of all the whining and all the, ah, you know, no, no, they, they actually want, you know, the, the, the most foundational, whatever need of a human is to feel needed. You know, that, that, that's why old people who have pets uh, live longer than people who don't have pets. I got, I got to get up to feed the, you know, right. we all, we all uh, need to feel needed, but you know, the video game doesn't actually need you. I mean, it can sit there and it, it, it doesn't have any need. So there, there's something about participating in life in things that can respond. Even a tomato plant can, and I'm stuck on tomato. Well, I love tomatoes, but, um, uh, you know, a, a tomato plant can respond. It responds to us. Uh, the chicken responds to us. The, uh, and, and so, and so to, to be with something that responds, that's, that's, um, that, that has, that has choice to, to say, I will, you know, I, I will affirm you. Um, that's a, you know, that's a profound, that's a profound thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about the business side again, things. Let's talk about, let's talk first about the wealth thing. And I know you have some wealthy clients. I'm just asking like, okay, so I have a million dollars or $10 million or whatever that number is. And then we'll talk about the person that doesn't have as many options. But let's talk about the wealthy. Ten million dollars, and what do I do? Go buy a, a a thousand acres somewhere out in the middle, and you know, put a farmhouse on it. <laughs> What's the business template if you weather the business plan? Yeah, yeah. Well, pro- probably the most common thing that I see, uh, because I do do a fair amount of consulting, and. Um, and I have in the last couple of years been uh, contacted by, I think now five, uh, five billionaires, not millionaires, billionaires who Good have, asked, yeah, who have asked 
um, I think the wheels are going to fall off. Can you help me, you know, get a safe place? And, and so I, I've started calling these, they don't call it that, but I call these agrarian bunkers. You know, that what they want is an agrarian bunker. Okay. That's what they are, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what they are. And, um, and, and uh, once in a while, one of them will do okay. But most of the time they, they don't appreciate uh, the, um, you know, the level of whatever understanding experience, practical working out uh, of getting this, getting this to go. And they're used to just throwing money at things and, making it happen and so you know so i end up going and and they've 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 already spent uh who knows how much money on fences and the fences are all in the wrong place for example uh and and so um so for for the wealthy um i will tell you this that we have helped about five of these folks um find land near us that we manage for them. So they have a bug out place. They don't live on it. They still, they're still doing their thing, but they know that if, if the wheels fall off and they can get there, we'll, you know, they can join our community. And, and meanwhile, we're managing their land and, and upgrading it and getting fences in and water lines and, you know, and, and de developing it, developing it as, as a, as a, as a resilient farm. Um, production unit and that's a you know that that's that's a big deal so um that's a great idea yeah. so so if you can so if you're if you're a, a wealthy person and you can hook up and you can hook up with someone and just you know look if you're wealthy you're probably used to delegating all right right and enjoy delegating enjoy you know and and uh yeah, the biggest, those of us who do some of this, you know, we talk amongst ourselves and our biggest frustration is going to a wealthy person and they, they won't listen. Somehow they think that their whatever mental acuity to have achieved what they've achieved financially is going to translate immediately into which tree to cut, uh, where to build a road, where to put on a fence, uh, where to put the corral. And the fact is they end up, you know, wasting a, a tremendous amount of money in the wrong places. And then they get frustrated, frustrated because, well, I thought this thing was going to, you know, generate some income. Well, it, it's, it's not all that easy. And, right. uh, and so if you can, if you can hook up with a, with somebody who has a track record, um, you're, you're in good shape. And like I say, we, we, we now, we now manage, I think five, five places of people who live in the city. They have independent wealth. But but they now have this this bug out place, and um and it's a it's a it's a it's really a one it's a very synergistic thing because we can then expand, and uh and 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 grow more and scale as a as a farm, um, we we take care of their taxes and fences and you know uh, that sort of thing, and and the, and we can and, and they can kind of learn you know fr uh, from us we can take them along. And they don't have to be dumping a bunch of money in the wrong place. I mean, we just had one. We uh, we shepherded a pond project. They wanted to build a pond. Well, so we we arranged for the excavator. We went over and we set it up and all this. And and um, uh, you know we've built whatever twenty ponds over time. And we're really good at at siting and deciding how big, where it should be, that sort of thing. Pond. If you're not familiar with that, you know you're gonna you're gonna pour you know, $20,000 in a pond and it's going to be in the wrong place. You're not going to have a, you're not going to have a clue, you know, how to do it. And so, um, so we, we can leverage, we can leverage, you know, their investment, they can leverage our experience and it's a very symbiotic thing. Um, yeah. r r running, running out as a, as a, as a farm novice with a pile of money in your pocket is one of the quickest ways to make a lot of bad decisions and lose a lot of money quickly. Yeah, I think that is the template, knowing a lot of very wealthy people. It's they're very good at making money in what they've done, if you would. Yes. And and they're very good at hiring managers mm -hmm. to make decisions for them. And then they enjoy as they should, they enjoy whatever they've invested in. So yeah. yeah, I think that is a great template. Now let's talk about somebody 
uh, that doesn't have a whole lot of options. Maybe they're, they could either be single or let's talk about that. Somebody that's single, or let's say they have a young family or even like, uh, doesn't even have to be a young family, but they, they don't have the options, but they want to do something or they think they want to do mm -hmm. something like this. What would you recommend to them? Yeah. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of different things. I'm a big believer in the, in the proximity principle. The proximity principle is whatever you want to do, get as close as you can to what you really want. If, if you can't do what you really want to do, get as close as you can to it. And what you really want to do will eventually come your way. Too many people want, want to make too big an incremental step. They want to go right. from zero, want to go from zero to a hundred in, you know, in 10 feet. And you can't go from zero to a hundred in 10 feet. And so incremental is a, is a big deal. And I've watched, I mean, the young people who've come here for our apprenticeship program and things, I've watched numerous of them, you know, it, it kind of in a three-step process. And so what might those steps look like? So the first step would be to move, to move near where you want to be. Uh, and, and that could be determined by politics, uh, uh, weather, uh, landscape, uh, memory, you know, our family went through here and I've just, I just love that part of the country, you know, whatever it is. Okay. But, but, but get, uh, get to where you want to be and, and, and rent, you know, you don't have to buy anything rent and let time be your friend. Don't be in a hurry. The, the worst, the worst, uh, financial decisions we make are when we are, when we're in hurry up mode, we don't buy the right car. We don't buy the right house. We don't buy the right piece of land. When you're in panic, when you're in panic mode, oh, oh, I've got to, I've got to buy this right now. You're not going to buy the right goodness, the, the right pants or the right shirt. You know, when you're in a, when you're in a panic mode, rent for a while, get, get familiar with the community. And then, and then, um, you know, if, if, if something comes up, you, you, you can buy it. Uh, otherwise sometimes you can, you, you can collaborate with somebody for example, that's one of the reasons I love pastured poultry. Numerous people have started with pastured poultry on an existing farm and they don't spend a penny. You know, in other words, they go to a, a beef cattle farm or, or an orchard or something. Hey, I'll run chickens on here and grow more grass for you. And you don't have to pay me a dime for it because the grass will grow better behind the chickens. And, and so they actually start a farm business um, on, on land that they don't pay any rent for and don't have to own. So, um, so the, 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 the portable infrastructure, uh, is a big deal. Uh, you could, you know, somebody has got a, an edge wood lot. You can start running some pigs in there with electric fencing. And, and so there are a lot of options. Um, and, and in my book, John, I've written a bunch of books and, and I, I'm big on, um, on not buying initially, but just starting. Uh, you know, find a friend, find a, a collaborator. It might be somebody at church. It might be somebody at the Ruritan Club or, you know, a philanthropic organization or whatever. Circulate, circulate within the community and find those opportunities. There are, the average American farmer is 60 years old. They are desperate. <laughs> they are desperate for a pair of hands. Um, friend one, he doesn't have to be organic. It doesn't matter. He still would love a pair of hands to help hold a board. If he's nailing the other end, just go and, you know, shut down your Netflix and shut down your Caribbean cruise and go and go, uh, um, you know, enjoy starting a friendship with, with a farm. And you would be surprised. Listen, I have any, I have letters from 80 year old farmers saying, can you find me? I just got one last week. Can you find me a young person to inherit my farm to? My kids don't want it. They'll just sell it. Can you find me a young person to inherit my farm to? Uh, um, so there, there are opportunities, but, but, you, but you have to be willing to cultivate, to, to serve. You have to be willing to serve for a while to create emotional and, and, uh, and friendship relational equity um, so that you can then it maybe, you know, you, you'd be surprised what, you know, what might come your way. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, I, somebody wants to, to give you a farm if you work at, I mean, that's a great deal. Um, I can't think of a better investment or a better deal right now to be candid with you. Yeah. Um, I listened recently, this was fascinating to me, uh, 
one of the barriers, if you would, for organic or purchasing organic is the cost of entry, if you would. Um, and I listened to you, I don't remember where it was, but it was on an interview you had where you are actually very competitive now with the big players and cost. Yeah. So that's part of the business aspect of this. So if you're, that shouldn't be a barrier of entry if you want to farm. And it certainly shouldn't be a barrier, barrier entry if you want to, to buy good food. If you would talk a little bit about that, how you're now, again, how organic is actually or is becoming very, very reasonable in price. And it's also very, uh, there's a lot of, um, there's good money. You're, you're a thriving farm, but for organic yeah. you're competing. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So we, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't have anything to hide. We, you know, we're, we're flat night. 2023 was financially the best year we've ever had here, uh, in, in half a century. Uh, Congratulations. We, That's never, music to my ears. Yeah. Never had such a good year. And, uh, and it's a confluence of a lot of things, Andy, and thank you for pursuing this point because so, because most of my life I've been accused of being a, a food elitist, you know, you've got to be a, you know, a doctor or an attorney in order to, you know, buy your food, that sort of thing, because the price has always been, you know, higher than it is in the grocery store because, because we don't take government subsidies and all of our prices are figured in. Let me uh, interrupt you very real quick. So yes, but what we found, and I want to get to your point, but what we found as a family, we were paying more money, but we weren't meaning per item for good food, but we weren't spending as much because that was more filling and we weren't getting like the snacks, the the chips and that sort of thing. And then we were saving significantly a lot more on doctor bills. Yeah. Just so you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, you're yeah, you're 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 already you're already out there. Um, I mean, the, the quickest the quickest way and easiest way to save money is to buy unprocessed. Get a whole chicken, not a chicken breast. Uh, get get a get a quarter of beef, not you know a T-bone steak. Um, all of these. I mean, on our our farm, we have substantial substantial um, you know price discounts for volume purchases because it. it it, it's easier for everybody, right? And uh, and so so yeah, uh, buy unprocessed, and um, and and especially if you can go straight straight to the farmer. Well, what what we saw what happened uh, during COVID was that and and, th and then Ukraine the Ukraine thing that spiked fertilizer prices. The combination that that was a double whammy. Uh, the, the COVID thing which disrupted um, our our supply chain. And then, and then Ukraine, which disrupted the whole fertilizer, other things. What happened was prices spiked, as you know, they spiked, or, or you couldn't even get stuff. And and what we found was that our prices were lower than Costco. Uh, now they 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 they've adjusted now. They've that's no longer the case now. But but they they never came down that much. And the beauty was we didn't have to go up much because. We didn't have a long supply chain. We didn't have that problem. We didn't have a warehouse where workers were getting sick. And we didn't have, uh, and, and we don't, we're not dependent on Vladimir Putin for our, for our fertilizer. You know, we don't buy any of it. So all of those things that, that were, that were uh, literally, you know, black swan events within the, the greater system, we were immune to. And wow, I mean, I, I, um, for us, it was a real epiphany of, of, you know, if, if we can, as a farm business, if we can immunize ourselves, you know, against the, the fragility of the system, that's a really, really big deal. And so, and, and so, and so interestingly, I'll just finish with this little, uh, tidbit, uh, spring, spring a year ago. We finally figured out how to actually ship eggs. I never thought I would ship. What do you ship eggs? That's crazy, you know. But uh, we had people asking for them, and so okay, we can ship eggs. So, um, so we started shipping eggs last spring, and you know what? We can ship eggs to New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles cheaper than they can buy them at farmers market. So, and awesome. metropolitan areas with their defund the police, their homelessness, their tax, their tax situations, their regulatory situations. They are so uh, uh, anti-business 
in a lot of those areas that their cost of of doing business and hiring somebody i mean uh, california just raised the the minimum wage of a of fast food workers you know to 20 20 dollars an hour okay what that does is it makes all of us non californians very competitive we can now in other words if if a, if a farmer like us in california wants to hire somebody to put away eggs they're going to have to pay them 20 bucks an hour well we've got people here who think they've died and gone to heaven if they get 14 okay or 15 and so uh, because our cost of living is so much lower our taxes are so much lower our our regulatory climate is so much lower and so it's just an amazing inversion of of these uh, uh, these small government, uh, you know, um, uh, laid back kind of old fashioned areas are able to sell into these metropolitan um, expensive areas and actually compete at price just because the price of security and labor and everything else is so much higher in those areas. Good regulation. Yeah, uh, and one last question. So a friend of mine texted me just right before I got on. He wanted me to ask you a question. Um, what is, so he has, I'm assuming, he has a few hundred acres, if not more, out in rural Georgia. And what's the... What's the net or well, what's the gross he can make per acre having a small independent farm? And my guess is his acreage is it's less than two hundred. So yeah, what what what's the number or dollar per acre, if you would? Okay, you can well, see is reasonable. Let me let, 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 let me let me just give you let me just give you our um, you know what we do. Yes, so, you would. So, yeah. So we we run 600, 600 broilers per acre, and uh, they're twenty bucks a piece. So that's twelve thousand uh, uh, dollars for an acre. And then you've got the the cows, the cattle, which are going to be about eight hundred per acre. Then you've got turkeys uh, that are going to be about ten thousand per acre. And then you've got the uh, Millennium Feathernet eggs uh, that are going to be about um, eight eight thousand per acre. So if you add that up, um, what you've got is zero zero eight twenty two. You've got thirty. You've got thirty thousand thirty thousand dollars per acre. Now that's gross. That's gross. Okay. But if you figure a thirty percent a thirty percent enterprise margin, that still gives you up there around nine thousand uh, dollars per acre to go to your overheads. You know your property taxes and insurance and and pay for your your pickup truck and things like that. Um, so so that's where you get this permaculture stacking, where you get this this. Um, it, it's not just raising, you know, apples in an apple orchard or cattle or whatever. It it it's actually you're stacking these enterprises on there, and then and then you're direct marketing them. So then you're getting retail dollar, not wholesale, which is only nine percent of the retail dollar. You're getting the whole thing, and you start wearing. Those the hats of the middlemen, you know, the distributor, the processor, the marketer, and and that you know, the, all every farmer sits on a stand, leans on the corner of his pickup truck and whines to his neighbor, "Oh, there ain't no money because the middleman takes it all, right?" And and so uh, for me, if the middleman is where the money is, then I want to be one, you know, the middleman, sign right? Me up. Yeah, sign me up to be the middleman. And so <laughs> so that's so that's exactly what we do, and. Um, and so, yeah, it's um, it, it's it's a pretty exciting time. Sounds awesome. Well, Joel, uh, I think this is the beginning of time. I think this is a great place to wrap up. I I could we could talk for hours and hours. I, I find it fascinating. I'm actively involved on the consumer level, mm -hmm. as well as uh, doing it ourselves in our backyard. If you would, could you please if give your contact info in three different ways? Number one. For the consumer out there that wants to buy your eggs or your chicken, number two, if it's somebody that's looking for an apprenticeship, um, where they can reach out to you, and number third is that wealthy individual that hey, I want to slap a land and a bug out farm, if you would, 
but I don't want to manage it and have you manage it. How would they go about doing that? Sure, sure. So for the for, so uh, they're all roughly the same. We have one one big comprehensive website, polyfacefarms.com, and and uh, it has different obviously different tabs for all these things. Uh, polyfacefarms.com. Yeah, you can buy our beef, chicken, uh, turkey, uh, uh, pork, whatever eggs. Um, uh, and we, we welcome you to do that. And, and I'll tell you, Andy, nothing makes us happier than getting a note from somebody. Hey, I've been buying from you for a year. I finally found my local supplier or found my little two acre homestead spot. And I won't be buying as much, but I'm so thankful that you got me started. We are glad to be a pump primer for people who don't know where to turn and are looking for some place to start. Uh, glad to do that. So, uh, so polyfacefarms.com. Apprenticeship, same thing. Apprenticeship, we take queries from August 1 to August 10. And uh, again, we open up a special little uh, email spot on polyfacefarms.com uh, for the apprenticeship. The, the the person who's bought a place and wants us to come and take a look at it, um, same thing. Uh, Polyface Farms and Wendy, my personal assistant, picks up all those uh, all those emails. And she fires the ones that I need to me and the ones that Daniel needs to him and the ones that are about money to Teresa, who handles the accounting. And, and so she disseminates those throughout. So the the, the comprehensive website is uh, Polyface Farms, P-O-L-Y-F-A-C-E, the farm of many faces. And uh, I'm just one of the faces. There's a lot of faces. Uh, Polyface Farm, and we will absolutely be uh, be glad to serve anyone that contacts us. Jewel, thank you so much. And uh, you primed the pump for me you know, about 20, well, 15 years ago. And uh, we are, my family and I are very, very grateful to you. So thank you. Thank you, Andy. It's been a delight to be with you. Absolutely.